The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we're going to talk about multi-core programming. Um, and I, as I was just informed by Charles, it's 2018. I had 2017 on the slide. OK, so first, uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, you turned in the uh, first project beta. Here's a, uh, here's a plot showing the tiers that different groups reach for the beta. Uh, and this is in sorted order. And we set the beta cutoff to be tier 45. Um, the final cutoff is tier 48. So the final cutoff we did set a little bit aggressively. But uh, keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to get to the final cutoff in order to get an A on this project. OK, so uh, we're going to talk about multi-core processing today. Um, that's going to be the topic of the next project after you finish uh, the first project. So. Uh, so in a multi-core processor, uh, we have a whole bunch of cores that are uh, all placed on the same chip, and they have access to uh, shared memory. Um, they usually also have uh, some sort of private cache um, and then a shared last level cache, so L3 in this case. Um, and then they, they all have access to the same memory controller, which uh, goes out to main memory, and then they also have access to uh, I.O. Um, but for a very long time, uh, chips only had a single core on them. So uh, why do we have multi-core processors nowadays? Why did semiconductor vendors start producing chips that had multiple processor cores on them? Um, so the answer is because of two things. So first, there's Moore's law, uh, which says that uh, we get more transistors uh, every year. So the number of transistors that you can fit on a chip doubles approximately every two years. And secondly, there's the end of uh, scaling of clock frequency. So for a very long time, we could just keep increasing the frequency uh, of the single core on the chip. Um, but at, a, uh, at around 2004 to 2005, that was no longer the case. Uh, we couldn't scale the clock frequency anymore. So here's a, a plot showing uh, both the number of transistors you can fit on the chip over time, as well as the clock frequency of the processors over time. And notice that the y-axis is in log scale here. And the blue line is basically Moore's law. Uh, which says that the number of transistors you can fit on the chip uh, doubles approximately every two years. And that's been growing pretty steadily. So this plot goes up to 2010. Um, but in fact, it's been growing even up until the present. And it, it will continue to grow for a couple more years uh, before Moore's law ends. However, if you look at the clock frequency uh, line, you see that it, it was growing quite steadily until about uh, the early 2000s, and then at that point, it sort of uh, flattened out. Um, so uh, at that point, uh, we couldn't increase the clock frequencies anymore, and the clock speed was bounded at about 4 gigahertz. So nowadays, if you go by a processor, it's usually still bounded by around uh, 4 gigahertz. It's usually a little bit less than 4 gigahertz because it doesn't really make sense to push it all the way. but uh, uh, you might find some uh, processors that uh, are around 4 gigahertz nowadays. Um, so, so what happened at around 2004 to 2005? Does anyone know? OK, so, um, uh, so Moore's law basically says that we can fit more transistors on a chip because the transistors become smaller. And when the transistors become smaller, uh, you can reduce the voltage that's needed to operate the transistors. And as a result, you could increase the clock frequency while maintaining the same power density. And that's what manufacturers did until about 2004 to 2005. They just kept increasing the clock frequency to take advantage of Moore's law. But it turns out that once transistors become small enough and the voltage used uh, to uh, operate them becomes small enough, uh, there's something called leakage current. So there's current that uh, leaks. And we're unable to keep reducing the voltage while still having reliable switching. 
Um, and if you can't reduce the voltage anymore, uh, then you can't increase the frequency, the clock frequency, uh, if you want to keep the same power density. So uh, here's a plot uh, from Intel back in 2004 when they s s uh, first started producing multi-core processors. And this is plotting the power density versus time. And again, the y-axis is in log scale here. Um, so uh, the green data points are actual data points, and the orange ones are projected. And they projected what the uh, power density would be if we kept increasing the clock frequency uh, at at a trend of about 25 to 30% per year, which is what happened up until around 2004. And because we couldn't reduce the voltage anymore, the power density will go up. Um, and you can see that uh, eventually it reaches the power density of a nuclear reactor, which is uh, pretty hot. And then, uh, and then it reaches the power density of a rocket nozzle, and eventually you get to the power density of, a, of the sun's surface. Um, so if you have a chip that's, uh, that has a power density equal to the sun's surface, uh, well, you don't actually really have a chip anymore. Um, you, uh, <laughs> right. And so basically, if you get into this orange region, you basically have a fire, and you can't really do anything interesting in terms of performance engineering at that point. So to solve this problem, um, uh, semiconductor, ve semiconductor vendors, they didn't uh, incre increase the clock frequency anymore, but we still had Moore's Law giving us uh, more and more transistors every year. So what they decided to do with these extra transistors uh, was to put, put them into multiple cores and then put multiple cores on the same chip. So we can see that starting at around 2004, the number of uh, cores per chip uh, uh, becomes more than one. And, and each generation of Moore's Law will potentially double the number of cores that you can fit on a chip because it's uh, doubling the number of transistors. And we, we've seen this trend um, up until about today. And again, it's going to continue for a couple more years uh, before Moore's Law ends. So that's why we have chips with multiple cores today. So today, we're going to look at multi-core processing. Um, so I first want to introduce the abstract multi-core architecture. So this is a, a very simplified version, but I can fit it on this slide, and it's a, a, a good example for illustration. So here, uh, we have a whole bunch of processors. They each have a cache, so that's indicated with the dollar sign. Um, and usually, they, they have a private cache as well as a shared cache. Um, so a shared last level cache, like the L3 cache, and then they're all connected to the network. Um, and then throughout the, through the network, they can connect to the main memory. They can all access the same shared memory. Um, and then usually there's a separate network for the I.O. as well, even though I've drawn them as a single network here, so they can access the I.O. interface. And potentially the network will also connect to other uh, uh, multiprocessors on the same system. And this abstract multi-core architecture is known as a chip multiprocessor, or CMP. So that's the architecture that we'll be looking at today. So here's an outline of uh, today's lecture. So uh, first, I'm going to go over uh, some hardware challenges with uh, shared memory multi-core machines. Um, so uh, we're going to look at uh, the cache coherence protocol. And then after looking at hardware, we're going to look at some software solutions uh, to, program, to write parallel programs on these multi-core machines to take advantage of the uh, extra cores. And we're going to look at several concurrency platforms uh, listed here. We're going to look at pthreads. Um, this is basically a low-level API for um, accessing uh, or for uh, running your code in parallel. And if you program on Microsoft, products, uh, the Win API threads is pretty similar. Then there's Intel threading building blocks, which is a library solution to concurrency. And then there are two linguistic solutions that we'll be looking at, OpenMP and Silk Plus. And Silk Plus is actually the uh, concurrency platform that we'll be using for uh, most of this class. <clears throat> 
Okay. Um, okay. All right, so let's look at uh, how caches work. So, so uh, let's say that uh, we have a value in memory at some location, uh, and that value is, uh, let's say that value is uh, x equals 3. If one processor says we want to load x, what happens is that processor reads this value from a main memory, brings it into its own cache, and then it also reads the value, uh, loads it into one of its registers. And it keeps this value in cache so that if it wants to access this value again in the near future, it doesn't have to go all the way out to main memory. It can just look at the value in its cache. Now what happens if another processor wants to load x? Um, well, it just does the same thing. It reads the value from main memory, brings it into its cache, and then also loads it into uh, one of the registers. And then same thing with another processor. Um, turns out that you don't actually always have to go out to uh, main memory to get the value. If the uh, value resides in one of the other processor's caches, you can also get the value uh, through the other processor's cache. And sometimes that's cheaper than going all the way out to uh, main memory. OK, so now, OK, so the second processor now loads X again, and it's in cache, so it doesn't have to go to main memory or anybody else's cache. So what happens now if we want to uh, store X, if we want to set the value of X to something else? OK, so let's say this processor wants to set X equal to 5. So it's going to write X equals 5 and store that uh, result in its own cache. So that's all well and good. Now what's, what happens when the first processor wants to load x? Well, it sees that the value of x is, is, uh, is in its own cache, so it's just going to read the value of x there, and it gets a value of uh, 3. So what's the problem there? Yes. Yeah, so the problem is that the, the value of x uh, in the first processor's cache is stale because another processor updated it. Um, so now we can't, this uh, value of x in the first processor's cache is invalid. Okay, so, so that's the problem. Um, and one of the main challenges of multi-core hardware is to try to solve this problem of cache coherence, uh, making sure that the values uh, in different processors' caches are consistent uh, across updates. OK, so uh, one basic protocol for uh, solving this problem is known as the MSI protocol. And in this protocol, each cache line is labeled with a state. Um, so there are three possible states, M, S, and I. And this is done on the granularity of cache lines, uh, because it turns out uh, that uh, storing this information is relatively expensive, so you don't want to store it for every memory location. So they do it on a, a per cache line basis. Does anyone know what the size of a cache line is on the machines that we're using? Yeah. 64 bytes. Yeah, so it's uh, 64 bytes. Um, and that's typically what you see today on uh, most Intel and AMD machines. Um, there are some architectures that have different cache lines, uh, like 128 bytes. But for our class, the machines that we're using will have 64 byte cache lines. It's important to remember that uh, so that when you're doing back of the envelope calculations, you can get accurate estimates. So three states in the MSI protocol uh, are M, S, and I. So M stands for modified. Um, and when a cache block is in the modified state, that means no other caches can contain this block in the M or the S states. The S state means that uh, the block is shared, so other caches can also have this block uh, in shared state. And then finally, I means the cache block is invalid. Uh, so that's essentially the same as the cache block not being in the cache. And to solve the problem of cache uh, coherency, when one cache modifies a location, it has to inform all, all the other 
uh, caches that their values are now stale because, uh, because this cache modified the value. So it's going to invalidate all of the other copies of that cache line in other caches by changing their state uh, from S to I. So let's see how this works. So let's say that the second processor wants to uh, store y equals 5. So previously, the value of y was 17, and it was in shared state. The cache line containing y equals 17 was in shared state. So now when I do y equals 5, um, I'm going to set the second processor's cache, uh, uh, that cache line to modified state. And then I'm going to invalidate the cache line in all of the other caches that contain that cache line. So now the first cache and the fourth cache uh, each have a state of i for uh, y equals 17 because that value is stale. Is there any questions? Yes. Um, if we already have to like tell the other things to switch to invalid, why not just tell them the value of y? Uh, yeah, so there are actually some protocols that do that. So this is just the most basic protocol. Um, so this protocol doesn't do it, but there are some that are used in practice uh, that actually uh, do do that. So it's a good point. Yeah, but I just want to present the most basic protocol uh, for now. Um, sorry. OK, and then when you load a value, uh, you can first check whether, uh, whether your cache line is, a, is an M or S state. And if it is an M or S state, then you can just read that value directly. Um, but if it's in uh, the I state or if, or if it's not there, then you have to fetch that block from uh, either another processor's cache or fetch it from uh, main memory. Um, so. Um, Turns out that uh, there are many other protocols out there. There's something known as uh, MESI, uh, the MESI protocol. Um, there's also MOESI and many other different protocols. And some of them are proprietary. And they uh, all do different things. Um, and it turns out that all of these protocols are quite complicated. And it's very hard to uh, get these protocols right. Um, and in fact, one of the most earliest successes of uh, formal verification was improving some of these cache coherence protocols to be uh, correct. Yes, question. What happens if two processors try to modify one value at the same time? Yeah, so uh, if two processors try to modify the value, one of them has to happen first. So the hardware is going to take care of that. So uh, the first one that actually modifies it will invalidate all of the other copies. And then the second one that modifies the value will again invalidate all of the other copies. And uh, when you do that, uh, when a lot of processors try to modify the same value, you get something known as an invalidation storm. So you have a bunch of invalidation messages going through uh, throughout the hardware. Um, and that can lead to a big performance bottleneck, because each processor, when when it uh, modifies its value, it has to inform all the other processors. Um, and if all the processors are modifying the same value, you get this sort of quadratic behavior. Um, the, the hardware is still going to guarantee that uh, one of the processors is going to end up writing the value there. But uh, you should be aware of this uh, performance issue when you're writing uh, parallel code. Yes? So all of this protocol stuff happens in hardware? Yes. Yeah, so this is all implemented in hardware. Uh, so if you take a computer architecture class, um, you'll learn much more about uh, these protocols and all of their variants. Um, so uh, for, per, for our purposes, we don't actually need to uh, understand all the details of the hardware. We just need to understand what it's doing at a high level so we can uh, understand when we have a performance bottleneck um, and why we have a performance bottleneck. So that's why I'm just introducing uh, the most basic protocol here. Any other questions? All right, so, so I talked a little bit about the shared memory hardware. Um, let's now look at some concurrency platforms. So uh, these are the four platforms that we'll be looking at today. Um, so 
first, uh, what is a concurrency platform? Well, uh, writing par uh, parallel programs is very difficult. It's very hard to get these programs to be correct. And if you want to optimize their performance, it becomes even harder. So it's very painful and error prone. And a concurrency platform abstracts uh, processor cores and handles synchronization and communication protocols. And it also performs load balancing for you, so it makes your lives uh, much easier. And uh, so today we're going to talk about some of these uh, uh, different concurrency platforms. So to illustrate these concurrency platforms, I'm going to do uh, the Fibonacci numbers example. So does anybody not know what Fibonacci is? So good, everybody knows what Fibonacci is. Um, OK, so, uh, so it's a sequence uh, where each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. And the recurrence here is, uh, the recurrence is shown in this brown box here. The sequence is named after Leonardo di Pisa, um, who was also known as Fibonacci, which is a contraction of Filius Bonacci, son of Bonaccio. So that's where the name Fibonacci came from. And uh, in Fibonacci's 1202 book, Liber Abaci, he introduced the sequence, uh, the Fibonacci sequence to Western mathematics, um, although it had been previously known uh, to Indian mathematicians for uh, several centuries. <laughs> but this is what we call the, the sequence nowadays, Fibonacci numbers. All right, so here's a Fibonacci program. Um, has anyone seen this al algorithm before? A couple of people. Probably more, but people didn't raise their hands. OK, so uh, all right, so it's a, a recursive program. Um, so. It basically implements the recurrence from the previous slide. So if n is less than 2, we just return n. Otherwise, we compute fib of n minus 1, store that value in x, fib of n minus 2, store that value in y, and then return the sum of x and y. So I do want to make a disclaimer to the algorithms, please, that this is actually a very bad algorithm. So uh, this algorithm takes exponential time. Um, and there's actually much better ways to compute the Fibonacci, the nth Fibonacci number. There's a, a linear time algorithm which just computes the Fibonacci numbers from bottom up. Um, this algorithm here is actually redoing a lot of the work because it's computing uh, 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 Fibonacci numbers multiple times. Whereas if you do a linear scan uh, from the smallest numbers up, uh, you only have to compute each one once. And there's actually an even better algorithm that takes logarithmic time. Um, and it's based on squaring matrices. So uh, uh, has anyone seen that algorithm before? Yeah, so a couple of people. Um, so if you're interested in uh, uh, learning more about this algorithm, I encourage you to uh, look at your favorite textbook, Introduction to Algorithms by uh, Corman, Lyserson, Rivest, and Stein. So even though this is a <laughs> yes. <laughs> So even though this is a, a pretty bad algorithm, um, it's still a good educational example um, because I can fit it on, the, on one slide and illustrate uh, all of the concepts of parallelism that we want to cover today. So here's the execution tree for uh, Fib of 4. So we see that Fib of 4 is going to call Fib of 3 and Fib of 2. Fib of 3 is going to call Fib of 2, Fib of 1, and so on. Um, and you can see the repeated computations here. So Fib of 2 is being computed uh, twice, and so on. Um, and if you have a much larger uh, tree, say you ran, it, ran this on Fib of 40, then you'll have uh, many more overlapping computations. Um, it turns out that uh, the two recursive calls <coughs> can actually uh, be parallelized because they're completely independent calculations. So the key idea for parallelization is to simultaneously execute uh, the two recursive uh, subcalls to FIB. And in fact, you can do this recursively. So uh, 
The two subcalls of FIBA3 can also be executed in parallel, and the two subcalls of FIBA2 can also be executed in parallel, and so on. So you have all of these calls uh, that can be executed in parallel. So that's a key idea for uh, extracting parallelism from this algorithm. OK, so let's now look at how we can use p threads uh, to implement this uh, simple Fibonacci algorithm. Uh, so p threads is a standard API for uh, threading, and it's uh, supported on all uh, Unix-based machines. And if you're programming using Microsoft uh, uh, products, then, uh, then the equivalent is Win API threads. And this is actually a uh, p threads is actually a standard um, in ANSI IEEE. Uh, so there's this uh, number here that specifies the standard. But nowadays we just call it p threads, and it's basically a do-it-yourself concurrency platform. So it's like the assembly language of parallel programming. It's built as a library of functions with uh, special non-C semantics. Uh, because if you're just writing code in C, you can't really uh, say which parts of the uh, code should be executed in parallel. So uh, p threads provides you a library of functions that allow you to uh, specify concurrency in your program. And each thread implements an abstraction of a processor. And uh, these threads are then multiplexed onto the actual machine resources. So the number of threads that you create doesn't necessarily have to match the number of processors you have on your machine. Uh, so if you have more threads uh, than the number of processors you have, then they'll just uh, be multiplexing. So you can actually run a pthreads program on a single, a single core, even though you have multiple threads in the program. They, they would just be time sharing. Uh, all the threads communicate through uh, shared memory, so they all have access to the uh, same view of the memory. And the library functions that pthreads provides mask the protocols involved in uh, inner thread uh, coordination. So you don't have to do it yourself, because it turns out that this is uh, quite difficult to do correctly by hand. So now I want to look at the key pthread functions. So the first pthread function is pthread create. And this takes four arguments. Um, so the first argument is this. Uh, I, uh, p thread underscore t type. Um, this is this is basically going to store an identifier for the new thread that p thread create will uh, create, so that we can use that thread in our uh, computations. Uh, p thread attribute uh, uh, t. Uh, this sets some th uh, thread attributes, and for our purposes, we can just set it to null and use the default attributes. The third argument is this function. Uh, that's going to be executed after we create the thread. So we're going to need to define this function that we want the thread to execute. And then finally, uh, we have uh, this void star argu arg argument, which stores the arguments that are going to be passed to the function that we're going to be executing. Um, and then pthread create also returns an error status, uh, returns an integer specifying whether the thread creation was successful or not. And then there's another function called pthread join. Um, pthread join uh, basically says that we want to block uh, at this part of our code until all of the um, until uh, sorry until this specified thread finishes. So it takes as argument uh, pthread underscore t. So this thread identifier and these thread identifiers were created when we called pthread pthread create. Um, also has a second argument. Uh, status, which is going to store the, the status of the terminating thread. Uh, and then pthread join also returns an error status. So essentially what this does is says to wait until uh, this thread finishes before we uh, continue on in our program. So any, any questions so far? OK, so here's what the implementation of Fibonacci looks like uh, using pthreads. So on the left, we see the original program that we had, um, uh, the fib function there. That's just the sequential code. Um, and then we have all this other stuff uh, to enable it to uh, run in parallel. 
So first we have this uh, struct on the left, uh, thread args. This struct here is used to uh, store the arguments that are passed to the function that the thread is going to execute. And then we have this thread func. Um, what that does is uh, it, uh, it reads the input argument from this thread args struct, and then it uh, sets that to i, and then it calls fib of i. And that gives you the output, and then we store the result into the output uh, of the struct. Um, and then that also uh, just returns uh, null. And then over on the right-hand side, we have the main function that will actually uh, call the fib function on the left. So um, we initialize a whole bunch of uh, variables that we need for, uh, to execute these threads. Um, and then uh, we first check if n is less than 30. If n is less than 30, it turns out that it's actually not worth creating threads to execute this program in parallel because of the overhead of thread creation. So if n is less than 30, we'll just execute the program sequentially. Um, and this idea is uh, known as coarsening. So you uh, saw a similar example a couple lectures ago when we did uh, coarsening for sorting, but this is in the context of parallel programs. So here, uh, because there are some overheads to running a uh, function in parallel, uh, if the input size is small enough, uh, sometimes you want to just execute it sequentially. Um, and then we're going to, um, okay, so let me just walk through this code uh, since I have an animation. Okay, so the next thing it's going to do is it's going to uh, marshal the input argument to the thread. So it's going to store the input argument n minus 1 in this uh, 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 args struct. And then we're going to call pthread create uh, with a, a thread variable. Uh, for thread args, we're just going to use null. And then we're going to pass the thread func that we defined on the left. And then we're going to pass the args uh, structure. And in, inside this org structure, the uh, input is set to n minus 1, which we did on the previous line. Um, OK, and then uh, pthread create is going, to, uh, uh, is going to give a return value. Um, so if, uh, if the pthread creation was successful, then the status is going to be null, and we can continue. Um, and if that, uh, and when we continue, we're going to execute now fib of n minus two, and store the result of that into our result variable. And this is done at the same time that fib of n minus one is executing, because we created this uh, p thread, um, and we told it to call this uh, thread func uh, function that we defined on the left. So both fib of n minus one and fib of n minus two are uh, executing in parallel now. And then we have this uh, pthread join, uh, which says we're going to wait until the thread that we created finishes before we move on, because we need to know the result of both of the uh, sub calls before we can uh, finish this function. And once that's done, uh, well, we first check the status to see if it was successful. And if so, then uh, we add the outputs of the argument struct to the result. So args.output will store the uh, output of fib of n minus 1. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the pthreads code. Um, any questions on how this works? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the thread function. Yeah. Um, so it looks like you pass a void pointer, but then you cast it to something else every time you use it. That. Yeah, so this is because uh, the uh, pthread create function takes as input a uh, uh, void star pointer because it's actually a generic function, so it doesn't know what the data type is. It has to work for all data types, and that's why we need to cast it to void star when we pass it to pthread create, and then uh, inside the thread func, we actually do know what type of uh, pointer that is, so then we cast it. Yeah. So does this code seem very parallel? So how many parallel calls am I doing here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm only creating one thread. So I'm executing uh, two things in parallel. 
So if I ran this uh, code on uh, four processors, what's the maximum speed up I could get? So maximum speed up I can get is just two because I'm only creating, uh, I'm only running two things in parallel. So this doesn't uh, uh, recursively create threads. It only creates threads at the, uh, it only creates one thread at the top level. And if you wanted to make, make it so that this code actually uh, recursively created threads, it would actually become much more complicated. Um, and that's one of the disadvantages of uh, implementing uh, this code in P threads. So we'll look at other solutions that will make this task much easier. Um, so some of the issues with P threads are shown on this slide here. So uh, there's a, a high overhead to creating a thread. So creating a thread typically takes over 10 to the four, uh, fourth cycles. Um, and this leads to very coarse grain concurrency because uh, your tasks have to do a lot of work in order to uh, 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 amortize the cost of creating that thread. Uh, there are something called thread pools which can help, and the idea here is to create a whole bunch of threads at the same time to amortize the cost of thread creation. Um, and then when you need a, a thread, you just take one from the thread pool. So the thread pool contains threads that are just uh, waiting to do work. Um, there's also a scalability issue with this uh, code that I showed on the previous slide. Um, the Fibonacci code gets at most a uh, 1.5x speed up for two cores. Um, why is it 1.5 here? Does anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, so it turns out that the two, uh, the two calls that I'm executing in parallel, uh, they're not doing the same amount of work. So one is computing fib of n minus one, one is computing fib of n minus two. And does anyone know what the ratio between uh, these two values is? Yeah, so it's, it's the golden ratio. It's about 1.6. Um, it turns out that if you can get a speed up of 1.6, then that's great, but there are some overheads. Uh, so uh, this code will get about a 1.5 uh, speed up. And if you want to run this uh, to take advantage of more cores, then you need to rewrite this code and it becomes more complicated. Uh, third, there's the issue of modularity. So um, if you look at this uh, code here, uh, you see that uh, the Fibonacci logic is not nicely encapsulated within one function. We have that logic in the Fib function on the left, um, but th then we also have some of the Fib logic on the right uh, in our main function. And this makes, it, uh, this makes this code not modular. And if we, if we want to uh, build programs on top of this, it makes it very hard to maintain if we want to just change uh, uh, the logic of the Fibonacci function a little bit, um, because now we have to change it in multiple places instead of just having everything in one place. So it's not a good idea to uh, write code that's not modular. So uh, please don't do, it, do that in your projects. Okay, and then finally, um, uh, uh, the code becomes complicated because you have to actually uh, move these arguments around. That's known as argument marshalling. Um, and then you have to uh, engage in error-prone protocols in order to do load balancing. Um, so uh, if you recall here, we have to actually place the argument n minus 1 uh, into into args.input, and we have to extract the value out of args.output. So that makes the code uh, very messy. So why do I say shades of 1958 here? Does anyone know what, what happened in 1958? Who was around in 1958? <laughs> Just Charles. So there is a first something in 1958. What was it? So it turns out in 1958, uh, we had the first compiler, and this was the Fortran compiler. And uh, before we had the Fortran compiler, programmers were writing things in assembly. And when you write things in assembly, you have to do argu argument marshalling, because you have to place things into the appropriate registers uh, before calling a function and also move things around when you return from a function. And the nice thing about uh, the first compiler is that uh, it actually did all of this argument marshalling for you. So now you can just pass arguments to, to a function, and the compiler will generate code that will do the argument marshalling for, for us. 
Um, so having to do this in pthreads is similar to having to uh, write code in assembly because you have to actually manually marshal these arguments. Um, so uh, hopefully there are better ways to do this and indeed we'll look at some other solutions that uh, will make it easier on the programmer. Any questions before I continue? All right, so we looked at pthreads. Um, next, let's look at uh, threading building blocks. So threading building blocks is a library solution. It was developed by Intel. And um, it's implemented as a C++ library that runs on top of uh, na native threads. So the underlying implementation uses threads. But the programmer doesn't uh, deal with threads. Instead, the programmer specifies tasks. Um, and these tasks are automatically load balanced across the threads using a work stealing algorithm um, inspired by research at MIT, Charles Leisenstein's research. Um, and the focus of Intel TBB is on performance. And as we'll see, the code written using TBB is simpler than uh, what you would have to write if you used uh, pthreads. So let's look at how we can uh, implement Fibonacci using TBB. Um, okay, so uh, in uh, TBB, uh, we have to create these tasks. So in the Fibonacci code, we create uh, this fib task class. Um, and uh, inside the task, uh, we have to define this execute function. So the execute function is the function that performs the computation when we start the task. And this is where we uh, define the Fibonacci logic. Um, this task also takes as input uh, these arguments parameter n and sum. So n is the input here and sum is the output. OK, and um, in, TBB, in TBB, we can easily uh, create a recursive program that extracts more parallelism. Uh, and here what we're doing is we're recursively creating two child tasks, A and B. That's the syntax for uh, creating the task. Um, and here we can just pass the arguments to fib tasks instead of uh, marshalling the arguments ourselves. Um, and, and then uh, what we have here is a set ref count. And this basically uh, is the number of tasks that we have to wait for plus one, so plus one for ourselves. And in this case, we uh, created two children tasks, and we have ourselves, so that's two plus one. And then after that, uh, we start has b using the spawn b call. And then uh, we do spawn and wait for all uh, with a as the argument. And this basically says we're going to run uh, start task a, and then also wait for uh, both a and b to finish before we proceed. So uh, this spawn and wait for all call is going to look at the ref count that we set above and wait for that many uh, tasks to finish before it continues. And then after, uh, after both a and b have completed, then uh, we can just sum up the results and store that in the sum variable. And here, uh, these tasks are created recursively. So unlike the pthreads implementation that was only creating uh, one thread at the top level, here we're actually recursively uh, creating more and more tasks. So we can actually uh, get more parallelism from this code and scale to more processors. Um, we also need this main function just to start up the program. Uh, so what we do here is uh, we create a root task um, which just computes uh, fib of n, um, and then we call spawn root and wait uh, of a, so a is a task for the root, um, and then it will just uh, run the root task. So that's what T uh, Fibonacci looks like in TBB. So this is uh, much simpler than the pthreads implementation, and it also gets better performance because we can extract more parallelism from, uh, from the computation. Any questions? OK, so um, TBB also has many other features in addition to uh, tasks. So TBB provides many C++ templates to express common patterns. And you can use these templates on uh, different data types. 
So they have a parallel four, which is used to express loop parallelism. So you can loop over a bunch of iterations in parallel. They also have a parallel reduce for data aggregation. For example, if you, if you want to sum together a whole bunch of values, you can use a parallel reduce to do that in parallel. They also have a pipeline and filter uh, that's used for software pipelining. TBB provides many concurrent container classes, uh, which allow multiple threads to safely access and update the items in the container concurrently. So for example, they have uh, hash tables, uh, trees, priority queues, and so on. And you can just use these out of the box. And uh, they'll work in parallel. You can uh, do concurrent updates and uh, reads to these data structures. Um, TBB also has a variety of mutual exclusion library functions, such as uh, locks and atomic operations. So there are a lot of uh, features of TBB, which is uh, why it's one of the more popular concurrency platforms. And because of all of these features, you don't have to implement many of these things by yourself and still get pretty good performance. So TBB was a, a library solution uh, to the concurrency problem. Now we're going to look at two linguistic solutions, OpenMP and Silk. So let's start with OpenMP. So OpenMP is a specification uh, by an in uh, industry consortium. And there are several compilers available that uh, support OpenMP, uh, both open source and proprietary. So nowadays, GCC, ICC, and Clang all support OpenMP, uh, as well as Visual Studio. And OpenMP is, uh, uh, it provides linguistic extensions to C and C++, as well as Fortran, in the form of compiler pragmas. So you use these compiler pragmas uh, in your code to specify uh, which pieces of code should run in parallel. And OpenMP also runs on top of uh, native threads, but the programmer isn't exposed to these threads. OpenMP supports loop parallelism, uh, so you can do parallel for loops. Uh, they have task parallelism, as well as pipeline parallelism. So let's look at how we can imp implement Fibonacci in OpenMP. So this is the entire code. So I want you to compare this to the pthreads implementation that we saw uh, 10 minutes ago. So, so this code is uh, much cleaner than the pthreads implementation it, and also performs better. Um, so let's see how this code works. So we have these compiler pragmas or compiler directives. Um, and the compiler pragma for uh, creating a parallel task is uh, 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 OMP task. Um, so we're going to create an OpenMP task for fib of n minus 1 as well as fib of n minus 2. There's also um, uh, this, uh, yeah, there's also uh, this uh, shared pragma which uh, specifies that uh, the two variables in the arguments are uh, shared across different threads. So you also have to specify whether variables are private or shared. Um, and then uh, uh, the pragma OMP wait just says we're going to wait for the uh, preceding task to complete before we continue. So here it's going to wait for fib of n minus 1 and fib of n minus 2 to finish uh, before we return the result, which is what we want. And then after that, we just return uh, x plus y. So that's the entire code. Um, and OpenMP also provides many other pragma directives um, in addition to task. So we can use a parallel for to do uh, loop parallelism. There's reduction. There's also directives for scheduling and data sharing. So uh, you can specify how you want a particular loop to be scheduled. OpenMP has many different uh, scheduling policies. They have static parallelism, dynamic parallelism, and so on. Um, and then uh, these scheduling directives also have different grain sizes. Uh, the data sharing directives are specifying um, whether uh, variables are private or shared. OpenMP also supplies a variety of synchronization constructs, such as uh, barriers, atomic updates, mutual exclusion, uh, or mutex locks. So OpenMP also has many features, and it's also one of the uh, more popular uh, solutions to uh, writing parallel programs.
And as, as you saw in the previous example, the code is much simpler than if you were to write something using uh, PE threads or even uh, a TBB. This is a much simpler solution. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so with every um, compiler directive, does it spawn a new cache on a different processor? Uh, so, so this code here is actually uh, independent of the number of processors. So there is actually a scheduling algorithm that will determine how the tasks get mapped to different processors. So uh, if you spawn a new task, it doesn't necessarily uh, put it on a different processor. And you can have more tasks than the number of processors available. So there's a scheduling algorithm that will uh, take care of how these tasks get mapped to different processors. And that's hidden from the programmer, uh, although you can use uh, these uh, scheduling pragmas to uh, give hints to the compiler uh, how it should schedule it. Yeah. What role does the operating system play in the scheduling? Uh, so, um, I mean, underneath, this is implemented using uh, P threads, which has to make operating system calls to uh, basically uh, uh, directly talk to the processor cores and uh, do multiplexing and so forth. So, uh, it's, uh, the operating system is involved at a very low level. Okay, so the last concurrency platform that we'll be looking at today is Silk. Okay, so, um, uh, or we're gonna look at Silk Plus, actually. And the Silk part of Silk Plus is a small set of linguistic extensions to C and C++ that support fork join parallelism. So, for example, the uh, Fibonacci example uses fork join parallelism, so you can use Silk to implement that. And the plus part of Silk Plus uh, supports vector parallelism, which uh, uh, you had experience working with in your homeworks. Uh, uh, so Silk, was, uh, Silk Plus was initially developed by Silk Arts, which was an MIT spinoff. Um, and Silk Arts was acquired by Intel in uh, July 2009. And the Silk Plus implementation is based on award-winning, uh, based on the award-winning Silk multi-threaded language that was developed uh, uh, two decades ago here at MIT by Charles Isaacson's research group. <laughs> and it features a provably efficient uh, work stealing scheduler. So this scheduler is provably efficient. You can actually prove theoretical bounds on it. Um, and this allows you to implement theoretically efficient algorithms, which we'll talk more about in another lecture, algorithm design. But uh, it provides a, a provably efficient work stealing scheduler. Um, and Charles Larson has a very famous paper that has a proof of uh, that this scheduler is optimal. So if you're interested in reading about this, uh, you can talk to us offline. Uh, Silk Plus also provides a hyper-object library for parallelizing code with global variables. And you'll have a chance to play around with hyper-objects in homework four. Um, the Silk Plus ecosystem also includes uh, useful programming tools, uh, such as a Silk Screen Race Detector. So this allows you to detect determinacy races in your program uh, to help you isolate uh, bugs and performance bottlenecks. It also has a scalability analyzer called Silk View. And uh, Silk View will uh, basically analyze the, uh, the amount of work that your uh, program is doing, as well as the, uh, the maximum amount of parallelism that your code could possibly extract from the hardware. So that's Intel Silk Plus. But it turns out that we're not actually going to be using Intel Silk Plus in this class. We're going to be using a better compiler. Um, and this compiler is based on Taper LLVM. Um, and it supports the Silk subset of Silk Plus. And Taper LLVM was uh, uh, actually recently developed at MIT by uh, T.B. Shardle, who gave a lecture last week, uh, William Moses, who's a grad student working with Charles, as well as Charles Lyserson. Um, and <laughs> so talking a lot about Charles's work today. Um, and uh, uh, Taper LLVM generally produces better code relative to its base compiler uh, than all other implementations of Silk out there. So it's the best Silk compiler that's available today. Um, 
And uh, they actually wrote a very nice paper on this uh, last year, Charles Lyson and his group, and that paper received the best paper award at the annual symposium on principles and practices of parallel programming, or PPOP. So uh, you should look at that paper as well. Um, so right now, Taper LLVM uses the Intel uh, Silk Plus runtime system, but I believe Charles's group has plans to uh, uh, implement a better runtime system. And uh, Taper LLVM also supports more general features than existing Silk compilers. So uh, um, in addition to spawning functions, you can also spawn code blocks that are not separate functions, and this makes uh, uh, your uh, uh, this ri makes writing programs more flexible. You don't have to actually create a separate function if you want to execute uh, a code block in parallel. Any questions? So this is the silk code for Fibonacci. So it's also pretty simple. Um, it looks very similar to the sequential program, except we have these uh, silk spawn and silk stink statements in the code. So what do these statements do? So uh, silk spawn uh, says that the named child function, which is the function that is right after the silk spawn statement, uh, may execute in parallel with the parent caller. The parent caller is the function that is calling silk spawn. Um, so this says that uh, fib of n minus 1 can execute in parallel uh, with uh, the function that called it. And then this function is then going to call fib of n minus 2. And fib of n minus 2 and fib of n minus 1 now can be executing in parallel. And then silk sync says that control cannot pass this point until um, all of the spawn children have returned. So is this going to wait for fib of n minus 1 to return um, before we go to the return statement uh, where we add up x and y? So one important thing to note is that the silk keywords grant permission for parallel execution, but they don't uh, actually force or command parallel execution. So uh, even though I said silk spawn here, um, the, the runtime system doesn't necessarily have to run fib of n minus 1 in parallel with fib of n minus 2. Uh, I'm just saying that I could run these two things in parallel, and it's up to the runtime system to decide um, whether or not to run these things in parallel based on its uh, uh, scheduling policy. So um, let's look at another example of silk. So let's look at loop parallelism. So here we want to do a matrix transpose, uh, and we want to do this in place. So the idea here is we want to basically swap the elements below the, the diagonal to, the, uh, to its uh, mirror, uh, mirror image above the diagonal. And uh, here's some code to do this. So we have a silk four. Um, so this is basically a parallel for loop. It goes from i equals 1 to n minus 1. And then the inner for loop goes from j equals 0 uh, up to i minus 1. And then we just swap a of i j with a of j i using uh, these three statements inside the body of the for loop. So to, so to execute a for loop in parallel, you just have to add silk underscore to the, uh, uh, to the uh, for keyword. Um, and that's as simple as it gets. So this code is actually going to uh, run in parallel and get a uh, pretty good speed up on this uh, for this particular problem. Um, and internally, silk for loops are transformed into nested silk spawn and silk sync calls. So the compiler is going to uh, get rid of the silk for and ch change it into uh, silk spawn and silk sync. So it's going to recursively divide the iteration space into half. Um, and then it's going to spawn off uh, one half uh, and then execute the other half in parallel with that and then recursively do that until the iteration range becomes small enough, at which point it doesn't make sense to uh, execute it in parallel anymore. So uh, we just execute that range sequentially. OK. So that's loop parallelism in Silk. Any questions? Yes. If something weird, can I still do that? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so the compiler can actually figure out what the iteration space is. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to be incrementing by one. You can do something else. Uh, you just have to guarantee that all of the iterations are independent. Um, I, so if, if, you act, if you have a determinist you raise across the different iterations of your uh, silk for loop, then your result might not necessarily be correct. So you have to make sure that the iterations are indeed independent. Yes? Yeah, so you can nest silk fours. Um, but it turns out that for this example, usually you already have enough parallelism in the outer loop for large enough values of n. So it doesn't make sense to uh, put a silk for loop inside because using a silk for loop adds some additional overheads. Um, but you can actually uh, do nested silk for loops. And in some cases, it does make sense, uh, especially if, the, if there's not enough uh, parallelism uh, in that outermost for loop. So good question. Yes. What does the assembly code look like for the parallel code? Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it has a bunch of calls to the Silk runtime system. Um, I don't actually, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know all the uh, details because I haven't looked at this recently, but uh, I think you can actually generate the assembly code using a flag in the Clan compiler. So uh, that's a good exercise. Yeah, you probably want to look at the LLVM uh, uh, IR rather than the assembly to begin with to understand what's going on. Uh, it has three instructions that are not in the standard um, LLVM, which, uh, which were added to support parallelism. Uh, those things, when it's lowered into the assembler, into, um, assembly, each of those instructions becomes a bunch of assembly language instructions. So you don't want to mess with, uh, with looking at it in the assembler until you see what it looks like in the LLVM first. Yeah, so good question. Um, any other questions about this, this code here? OK. so. Let's look at another example. So let's say we had this uh, for loop where uh, on each iteration i, we're just incrementing a, a variable sum by i. Um, so this is essentially going to commute, com uh, compute the summation of everything from i equals 0 up to n minus 1, um, and then print out the result. So one straightforward uh, way uh, to, uh, uh, to try to parallelize this code is to just change the for to a silk for. So does this code work? Who thinks that this code doesn't work or doesn't compute the correct result? So about half of you. and. Who thinks this code does work? So a couple people, and I guess the rest of the people don't care. <laughs> uh, so it turns out that uh, it's not actually necessarily going to give you the right answer, because the Silk for loop says uh, you can execute these iterations in parallel, but they're all updating the same uh, shared variable sum here. So you have a, uh, what's called a determinacy race, uh, where uh, multiple processors can be writing to the same memory location. We'll talk much more about determinacy races in the next lecture. Um, but for this example, it's not necessarily going to work if you run it on uh, more than one processor. Um, and Silk actually has a nice way to deal with this. So in Silk, uh, we have something known as a reducer. This is one example of a hyper object, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And with a reducer, what you have to do is um, instead of uh, declaring the sum variable just has an unsigned long data type, uh, what you do is you use this macro called silk c reducer op add, uh, which specifies we want to uh, uh, create a reducer with the addition function. Um, then we have the variable name sum, the data type, unsigned long, and then the uh, initial value zero. And then we have a macro to register this reducer. So silk c register reducer. Um, and then now inside this silk for loop, we can uh, increment the uh, sum or reducer view of sum, which is another macro. 
by I, um, and you can actually execute this in parallel, and it will give you uh, the same answer uh, that you would get if you ran this sequentially. So the reducer will take care of this uh, determinacy race for you, um, and at the end, when you print out this result, you'll see that the uh, sum is uh, equal to the sum that you expect. And then after you finish using the reducer, uh, it uses other macro called silksy, an unregister reducer of sum that tells the system that you're done using this reducer. Um, so this is one way to uh, deal with this uh, problem when, you're, when you want to do a re reduction. And it turns out that uh, there are many other interesting reduction operators that you might want to use. And in general, you can create reducers for uh, monoids. And monoids are algebraic structures that have an associative binary operation as well as an identity element. So the addition operator is a monoid because it's associative, it's binary, um, and the identity element is zero. Um, Silk also has uh, several other predefined reducers, uh, including multiplication, min, max, and, or, x, or, et cetera. Uh, so these are all more monoids. And you can also define your own reducer. So in fact, in the next homework, you'll have the opportunity to play around with reducers and uh, write a reducer for uh, lists. So that's reducers. Um, another nice thing about Silk is that there's always a valid serial interpretation of the program. So the serial elision of a Silk program um, is always a legal interpretation. And uh, for the Silk source code on the left, the serial elision is basically the code you get if you get rid of the Silk spawn and Silk uh, sync statements. And this looks just like the uh, sequential code. Um, and remember that the Silk keywords grant permission for parallel execution, but they don't necessarily command parallel execution. So if you ran this, uh, if you ran this Silk code uh, using a single core, it wouldn't actually create these parallel tasks. And you would get the same answer as the sequential program. Um, and, this is, uh, and the serial elision is also a correct interpretation. So unlike uh, other solutions such as TBB and P threads, uh, it's actually difficult in those environments to uh, get a program that does what the sequential program uh, does because uh, they're actually doing a lot of additional uh, work to uh, set up these parallel calls and uh, create these argument structures and other scheduling constructs. Whereas in Silk, uh, it's very easy just to get the serial elision. You just uh, define Silk spawn and Silk sync to be uh, null. Uh, you also define Silk 4 to be 4. Um, and then this gives you a valid sequential program. So when you're debugging uh, code, and uh, you might first want to check uh, if, your, uh, if the sequential elision of your Silk program is correct. And you can easily do that by using these macros. Or actually, there's actually a, a compiler flag that will uh, do that for you and give you the uh, equivalent C program. So this is a nice way to debug, because you don't have to start with the parallel program. You can first check if the serial program is correct before you go on to debug the parallel program. Questions? Yes. Uh, so with Silk 4, um, does each iteration of the Silk, Silk 4, um, its own task that the scheduler decides if it wants to execute in parallel, or if it executes in parallel, do all of the iterations execute in parallel? Uh, so, so it turns out that uh, uh, by default, it, uh, it uh, groups a bunch of iterations together in, into a single task because it doesn't make sense to break it down into such small chunks uh, due to the overheads of parallelism. Um, but there's actually a, um, a setting you can do to change the grain size of the for loop. So you could actually make it so that each iteration uh, is its own task. And then, uh, and then as you said, the scheduler, scheduler will uh, decide how to map these different tasks onto uh, different processes processors, or even if it wants to execute any of these tasks in parallel? It's a good question. OK, so the idea uh, in Silk is to allow the programmer to express logical parallelism uh, in an application. So uh, the programmer just has to identify which pieces of the code could be executed in parallel, but doesn't necessarily have to uh, uh, 
determine which of the piece, which pieces of code should be executed in parallel. Um, and then Silk has a, a runtime scheduler that will automatically map the executing program onto the available processor cores at runtime. And it does this dynamically using uh, a work stealing scheduling algorithm. Um, and the work stealing scheduler is used to uh, balance the tasks uh, evenly across the different processors. And we'll talk more about the work stealing uh, scheduler in a future lecture. Um, but I want to emphasize that unlike, uh, unlike the other concurrency platforms that we looked at today, uh, Silk's uh, work stealing scheduling algorithm is uh, theoretically efficient, uh, whereas uh, the OpenMP and TBB schedulers are not uh, theoretically efficient. So uh, this is a nice property because it will guarantee you that um, the algorithms you write on top of Silk will also be theoretically efficient. Okay, so here's a high-level illustration of the uh, Silk ecosystem. Um, it's a very simplified view, but uh, I did this to fit it on a single slide. Um, so, so what you do is you take the Silk source code, you pass it to uh, your favorite Silk compiler, uh, the Taper LLVM compiler, um, and this gives you a binary that you can run on uh, multiple processors. Um, and then you pass a program input to the binary, you run it on uh, however many processors you, uh, you have, um, and then this allows you to benchmark the parallel performance of your program. Um, you can also do serial testing. And to do this, uh, you just obtain a serial elision of the Silk program, and you pass it to an ordinary C or C++ compiler, it generates a binary, um, that can only run on a single processor, and you run your suite of serial regression tests on this uh, single-threaded binary, um, and this will allow you to uh, benchmark the performance of your serial code um, and also debug any issues that might have arised uh, when you were running this program sequentially. Um, Another way to do this is uh, you can actually just compile the, the original Silk code, um, but run it on a single processor. So there's a command line argument that uh, tells the runtime system how many processors you want to use. And if you set that uh, parameter to one, then it will only use a single processor. And this allows you to uh, 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 benchmark the single threaded performance of your code as well. And the parallel program executing on a single core should behave exactly the same way as the execution of the serial elision. So that's one of the advantages of uh, using Silk. Um, and because, uh, because you can uh, easily do serial testing using the Silk platform, this allows you to uh, separate out the serial correctness from the parallel correctness. As I said earlier, you can first debug the serial correctness as well as any performance issues before moving on to the parallel version. Um, and another point I want to make is that uh, because, the, uh, because Silk actually um, uh, uh, uses the serial program uh, inside its tasks, it's actually good to optimize the serial program um, even when you're writing a parallel program because optimizing the serial program for performance will also translate to uh, better parallel performance. Um, Another nice feature of Silk um, is that it has this uh, tool called uh, Silk SAN, which stands for Silk Sanitizer. Um, and the Silk, uh, Silk SAN will uh, detect any determinacy races that you have in your code, which will significantly help you with uh, debugging the uh, correctness and, as well as the performance of your code. Um, so Silk SAN will, uh, if you compile the Silk code using the Silk SAN flag, it will generate an instrumented binary that when you run, it will uh, find and localize all of the determinacy races in your program. So it will tell you where the determinacy races occur so that you can go inspect that part of your code and uh, fix it if necessary. So this is a very useful tool for um, benchmarking uh, your parallel programs. Um, Silk also has another nice tool called Silk Scale. Um, Silk Scale um, 
uh, it's a performance analyzer. It will analyze how much parallelism is available in your program, as well as the total amount of work that it's doing. Um, so again, you pass a flag to the compiler that will turn on silk, silk scale, and it will generate a binary that uh, is instrumented. And then when you run, run this code, um, it will give you a scalability report. So you'll find these tools very useful when you're uh, doing the next project. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about these two tools in the next lecture. Um, and right, as I said, Silk Scale will analyze how well your program will scale to larger machines. So it's, it will basically tell you the uh, maximum number of processors that your code could possibly take advantage of. Any questions? Yes. What do you mean when you say runtime? Uh, so I mean the. Uh, uh, scheduler, the Silk runtime scheduler that's uh, uh, scheduling the t different tasks uh, when you're running the program. Um, so that's like included in the binary? Uh, so it's linked from the binary. Um, it's not stored in the same place. It's linked. Other questions? All right, so uh, let me summarize what we looked at today. So uh, first, we saw that. Um, uh, most processors today have multiple cores, and probably all of your laptops have more than one core on it. Who has a laptop that only has one core? Okay. <laughs> when did you buy it? <laughs> yeah, probably a long time ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see. Um, so. So nowadays, obtaining high performance on your machines requires you to write parallel programs. But parallel programming can be very hard, um, especially if you have to program directly on the processor cores and interact with the operating system yourself. So Silk is very nice because it abstracts the processor cores from the programmer, it handles synchronization and communication protocols, um, and it also performs provably good load balancing. And in the next project, you'll have a chance to play around with Silk. Um, you'll be implementing your own parallel uh, screensaver. So that's a very fun project to do. Um, and possibly in, in one of the future lectures, we'll post some of the nicest screensavers that students developed for everyone to see. OK, so that's all.